tries not to grumble too much. Uh, we, we tend to, women get quiet and they don't confront this, or because they do need the job, uh, or they quietly leave, which also costs them time in, in promotions and, and time in rank wherever they were. So I'm fine, and, and then there's a kind of despair in all of this, an emotional part of it, which is they're either so angry or they despair and say, I just can't change the stuff. So to me, I think we are coming to the place where, where I think we've turned the corner, is that with the wage gap stuck for the last 14 years, we've suddenly come to the place where we have to acknowledge there's something going on in the workplace that we're not dealing with here. And while women have been quiet, uh, it's, it's largely because they haven't seen ways in which they can act constructively without losing their jobs or being set back. So I think a large part of this right now is, is the kind of um, uh, trouble, uh, the, the systemic intransigence that we need to get at. And finally, let me um, uh, ask um, um, about the equivalence uh, issue, because that is a much harder case to make for many people. Uh, you know, when you do as um, Senator Harkin's uh, bill does, which really requires people to more fairly uh, assess the requirements for a job and to consider them more equivalent or comparable, even if they're not the same. Uh, do you have any advice, um, maybe I'll start with you, Ms. Samuels, do you have any advice about how best to make the case for, you know, comparability? Uh, and I know that it's worked in Minneapolis, in, in Minnesota and Iowa, but how would you make the case more generally? Well, I think uh, the case for it rests on what Dr. Cohen discussed, which is the continuing gender-based occupational segregation that we see in far too many industries and in far too many lines of work. It has worked in places like Minnesota, and there are various state laws that do mandate the kind of comparability comparison that the Fair Pay Act would ask the government to undertake. This is not a government mandate that would set pay for different industries. What it would require is that employers take a careful look at the credentials and qualifications that are required for each of their job lines and make a fair assessment about the value of that work to the company. It maintains employer discretion, but also addresses this very systemic, endemic problem that traditionally female jobs, because of the historical devaluation of women's work, continue to pay significantly less than traditionally male fields. Dr. Murphy. Thank you. Um, let me just add, I mean, you mentioned Minnesota, and Minnesota is a very interesting example because Minnesota pays 97 cents on the dollar for all of the women versus com compared to men. The interesting thing here is, is Minnesota took every job under the umbrella, under the roof of the state as an employer and ranked it similar to the guidelines that you're suggesting. And they ranked it by the qualifications, the skills, the experience, the accountability, the danger, all those things. And it allows them to, do, to solve this problem that you're hearing on both sides of me right now, which is about the, about the job segregation. Because when you rank all the jobs under the state's umbrella as an employer, you can compare the, woman, the nurse in the state hospital with the man who's driving the snowplow truck for the DPW and the woman who's a teacher or professor at the university with the guy who's out managing the forests and parks. It allows you to compare all those jobs and it gets at this occupational segregation problem under that roof. So holding that employer accountable for that kind of fairness and equity allows you to pay for the job, not who does the job. And once you do that, and once every employer pays for the job, not who does the job, you just solved all kinds of discrimination in the workplace. This is about race and handicap and age as well as gender. So it's a powerful concept. And, and the one final thing, and then I'll shut up. But, um, <laughs> I, I interviewed Faith Zwemke. The, the state of Minnesota, it cost the state of Minnesota to do this, to implement this bill, one paycheck right now. Her name is Faith Zwemke. And I talked to Faith Zwemke in, in preparing my book. And, and I asked her whether the methodology that the state of Minnesota uses uh, could be used by any employer. And she said yes. I mean, it, this can be used by a private employer as well as a public. The, so the, in, the methodology is here. The intellectual work has been done. It just needs to be applied to other employers. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, heck, all you got to do is look at the board of directors of all these companies, and it's uh, mostly white males. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and they try to get a few token women once in a while. But you look at who's running the businesses, who's running the companies. That's right. And then they set the policies. 
That's no secret. I mean, change the board of directors of a lot of these companies and put a majority of women on, you might get some changes made. I think you would. Senator Murray. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for having this hearing. I think this is really enlightening. And Senator Clinton, I want to thank you for pushing for this and your leadership on this. And uh, I listened with interest to your question about um, you know, women and, and perceptions. And one of my concerns is that women oftentimes don't believe this is a problem. And your leadership in bringing this up really helps highlight it. You can't solve a problem if people don't believe it's a problem. And I, Ms. Murphy, you talked about women just being deciding to be quiet. I'm more concerned, or just as concerned, that perhaps they're not speaking up because they don't know it's an issue. Do you find that out there? And Oh, yes. Oh, yes, particularly young women on campuses. I mean, I've spent a lot of time the last couple of weeks on campuses. And young women think it's all equal and fair uh, when they gra graduate. They're sort of excited. And then when you sort of talk about what happens and what they can lose, these women listen up in a way that's amazing because they suddenly get it. Uh, but this is, this is a part that, in which lots of other women don't as well, Senator Murray. But, but for young women on campuses, this is a very important lesson. Dr. Cohen, you agree with that? Uh, yes, I do. I think the, uh, the uh, one, one uh, uh, consequence of occupational segregation is, is uh, women often don't have direct comparisons to make uh, with men in the same job in the same establishment. And um, uh, uh, I guess if, if I can, well, I just am already talking in response to that sure. question about this um, segregation issue, um, uh, because it does get to the perceptions. Uh, the market, uh, the market does have some equalizing tendencies. You know, if if you if you're way out of step with uh, paying, underpaying, or uh, or overpaying some group, you may put yourself at a competitive disadvantage. Um, but the market also has a lot of historical and cultural baggage in the way that um, uh, uh, things are interpreted. And so um, uh, it may be that the, the, the comparable worth standard, the idea of comparing very different jobs and trying to establish the value uh, metals in the market uh, too much, as, as uh, uh, some courts have, have found. But the current mechanism seems to meddle too little. It doesn't allow enough uh, comparison uh, in, in ways that sometimes uh, the market needs. And I think um, the perceptions thing is a big part of that because, uh, um, uh, uh, well, like I said, people don't, people don't see other occupations as being um, directly comparable. And I think this sort of discussion can help highlight yeah. uh, those comparisons. Well, I think it is really important to have this discussion and these bills out there. I think part of the Pay Check Fairness Act is to help train young women with negotiation skills when they start out. You, the numbers you gave were startling about if you, uh, what, how much did you say you lose if you just have a high school education? $700,000. And if you have a PhD, it was over $2, Two million. million. So we want to make sure these young women know that there's a wage gap that they will, that will really impact them early on. So I think that's an important provision of it. But maybe if you could um, tell me what happens to the wage gap the longer a woman stays in, in the workforce. Does it close? Does it widen? Does it ever it even up? It tends to widen. I mean, the, in the interesting thing is if, if you think about a young woman who graduates uh, from college and gets a $30,000 job, and she's, she's excited because she says, my heavens, I'm, yeah. I'm earning more money than I ever expected to. I didn't realize it was worth that. It's more than my mom ever made. And, and the young man who just graduated from college with her gets a job in the same place, and he's making 33. And, and so she says, well, it's not much money. Uh, the end of the year, when the bonuses are paid, uh, he gets a bigger bonus because it's a percentage of the salary. The end of the year, the boss says, you know, he's a real comer. He's, he's hard charging. He's fired up. So we'll bump him up to 38, and she's good. She's solid. She's working hard. So we'll move her to 33, and, and suddenly she's earning the same the next year as he was the first year. And the bonus at the end of the year is even bigger. And at the end of that year, the boss says, well, he's, he's going to be one of our executives. He's managerial potential. We'll bump him up to 43. And she just said she's pregnant. And so, well, we want her when she comes back, when she's had her child. And, and she's very good, so we'll move her up to 35. And the longer they work, the wider this differential becomes until it accumulates to those huge okay, losses. So, uh, talk to me then about the retirement gap that also oh. is an impact of this that I know Senator Clinton and I have spent a great deal of time on, especially with Social Security. What happens there? Oh, it's huge. Be because all the way along, I mean, if an employer is contributing to the IRA, to the IRA or, or you're, you, ha you don't have as much money to put aside for your own retirement or your employer doesn't put aside as much retirement, so that accumulates as well. And because, as, as Senator Harkin was saying, women, women live longer, um, then at the end of life, you have less money over a longer life. So it, you're absolutely right. This compounds the problem for later on if you don't get at it from the very beginning. Okay, well, thank you very much. And, and I really appreciate, again, the leadership, Senator Harkin and uh, Senator Clinton, and hope that we can 
start making women more aware of the, that a gap is out there and it exists and putting in place the tools that they need at, the, at every level to make sure that they earn as much as they can. We will all benefit from that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Murray. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, first Dr. Cohen. Uh, I hope I don't catch you off guard. Is how does the pay gap affect men? And what would closing the pay gap mean to men, married men, single men? I don't right, care, just right. men. How well, would it affect them? Well, if it would be accomplished by raising women's wages, it would uh, uh, improve uh, the family incomes of married men, certainly. Okay, uh, fine. It, it's not clear. Uh, I don't know of any evidence that uh, um, uh, uh, remedying problems of gender discrimination has resulted in lower wages for men. Uh, there may be cases where that's the case, but that certainly has not been uh, the historical trend. When uh, uh, when the gender gap was closing, it was not um, in, in general at the expense of, of, of male wages. The last few years actually are an interesting exception there when wages for men uh, were falling, and that's the last couple points of the gender gap that we got were from mostly from men's falling wages. But that's not, um, that's not a consequence of raising wages for women as far as I can tell. Well, maybe you might get, uh, I throw this out for your consideration, you might get more men willing to take those jobs that have been condition that traditionally considered women's jobs. Certainly. If a nurse's aide paid the same as a truck driver, yes. hey, I might not like getting beat around that truck cab, that cab of that truck all the time. I might want to be a nurse's aide if I have the same equal pay and benefits and uh, retirement benefits, that type of thing. It might be a more appealing job. But if, if there's this huge wage gap, well, then I gravitate to something else. Absolutely. I agree. So it would allow men to be able to pursue different careers and different occupations than they might want to pursue right now. It also does give families more flexibility as and far as fathers. Yeah. That's right. If the women's maybe then the man maybe has more flexibility to do different things than what they have right now and to choose different options, for example. So I, I think that we tend to forget about that, you know, that men, men, are, men would be beneficiaries of this. <laughs> I mean, we always think about this as some kind of a of a zero-sum game. If they win, we lose. I don't think that at all. I, I think that, 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 that the whole society would gain on that. Um, I wanted, oh yes, I know. Um, I want to ask uh, the example, I think that uh, Ms. Samuels, you had in your, of the, and I'm going to read it. You didn't read it, but I'm going to read it. Um, recent examples of pay discrimination cases, because this is one that's very prominent now out in the public. In the largest employment discrimination suit ever filed, female employees have sued Walmart for paying women less than men for similar work and using an old boys network for promotions that prevented women's career advancement. One woman alleged that when she complained of the pay disparity, her manager said that women would never make as much as men because, quote, God made Adam first. Another woman alleged that when she applied for a raise, her manager said, men are here to make a career and women aren't. Retail is for housewives who just need to earn extra money. The Ninth Circuit recently reaffirmed the case as a class action on behalf of more than the 1.5 million women who are current and former employees of Walmart. I read that again uh, because, look, I mean, unless you live in some kind of isolated bubble in our society, and you lack all sensitivity whatsoever, you know this goes on every day in workplaces all over this country. And again, I think in many cases, I, 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 I've read a lot about this case, and uh, uh, these women were very brave to come forward like they did. And I think a lot of times women don't do that because they are single mothers. They do have kids to provide for, and they're hanging on, and they just don't need to be fired from a job and go out and beat around looking for another one, and so they just tend to absorb it. And, uh, and this old boys network kind of thing goes on all over the place. We know that. Come on. We have to kid each other about this. So that's why I think it's so important, not only for the, the paycheck fairness, to provide for the kind of, kind of uh, increased penalties and increased uh, 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 wherewithal for women to take these cases and to pursue them, uh, but also for broadening things out as we're trying to do with the uh, Pay Equity uh, Fair Pay Act. Um, I just, you know, again, I asked uh, Ms. Brown, uh, you are on the plaintiff side on all this, but surely you must recognize also that this kind of discrimination goes on every day, every day, every day. And so 
because women simply don't have the wherewithal a lot of times to file these suits and to go up against them, um, doesn't it behoove us as government, and in your statement, I read your statement, you're saying that there's things that government can do and government can't. Government can do training and, and uh, better education and things like that. But, but I ask rhetorically, uh, hasn't the government intervention in the past provided for better workplaces? Everything from OSHA laws to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, Americans with Disabilities Act to, that I'm probably more familiar with, Civil Rights Act, all these things that would not have occurred other than through government intervention. And are we short-sighting ourselves by saying that that's all that needs to be done. Now, there were people before the Civil Rights Act said we don't need that, we've done everything. There were people before the Americans with Disabilities Act said we don't need to do that. We've done all these things. There's plenty of ways for people to access the courts and take their cases on. And I'm just wondering if we aren't being a little short-sighted now by saying, well, we've done all we can do, we don't need to do any more uh, in that regard because we know that these things happen every day. Your comments. Yes, uh, Senator, thank you. I'm usually on the defense side, but uh, I, I really, first of all, I really disagree with you this, that this happens every day, everywhere. Uh, that if you pluck a number of anecdotes out of the experiences of millions and millions of people, you get a distorted view. And I think you should be comforted that at least in those workplaces that I interact with, I read cases about, I teach seminars, there has been radical change. I think the point of all the laws is to allow people to fulfill their potential, to express their values, to work in job conditions that they want to work in. Maybe they don't want to drive a truck. Maybe they would rather be in an office. But to tinker with the market forces in private employment seems to me to get at the problem in a, in a very, very, um, potentially destructive way, because it's the vibrancy of that market, the ability to come up with new jobs, to develop new technology, new services that we can sell globally that provides the opportunity for employees. And so what we need and what we have is the laws that say if you want a job, if you want the skills, if you want the education, if you want to work here, then go for it. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that you find barriers there, I don't think it's the job of, of courts or, or Congress to read people's minds and decide for them, I think you're being mistreated or I think you're in the wrong job. I think people have to step forward and the retaliation protections are substantial. These, law, these cases aren't little negative value cases. There are attorney's fee provisions. There are punitive and compensatory damages. So I think what we want to do is say we're not going to decide that these jobs are comparable to these other jobs. In a public sector, if an employer, if a state or a, a locality chooses to do that, that's, that's a legitimate choice. But for the private economy, you're talking something very different. But look what happened in Minnesota. First of all, you say that these anecdotes may give you a distorted view. I'm pained to ask, is Walmart a distortion? Uh, I don't mean that in terms of Walmart. I mean in terms of the situation that happened there. I don't think so. Uh, and I think life's experiences teach us that that's not a distortion. It's an everyday occurrence. Secondly, um, uh, just take a look at what Minnesota did. Now, Minnesota has closed its pay gap 97%. And we have a 3% disparity. So we have a case study in what a change in policy can mean on that level. So it's not as if we don't have uh, that, that, that we don't have something to base this on, we do. So how would you explain, I mean, other states have not done this and they don't have that 97%. They're still at 78, 79, 70, someplace down in there. So what's so different about Minnesota that it is than compared to uh, Massachusetts or <laughs> New York or Iowa? We did a little bit in Iowa, not much. So I'm just saying that well, that wouldn't have happened had it not been for, for a government a government, that in that case, the state government doing something. Well, what they've said is we're going to spend more money and we're going to pay jobs in a way that is not consistent with what the market would pay for them. We're going to say that conditions, skills, responsibility, and perhaps other factors Working are, conditions. Are, are not necessarily going to drive what jobs are paid, but we're going to make a decision by fiat that we're going to have an equal result. That has never been the law. The law is you can't intentionally discriminate against an individual because of a protected characteristic, and you can't pay people who are doing equal work 
under similar job conditions, different amounts because of their gender. But the to tinker with the economy, to have the Labor Department say, we think a job is worth a certain amount, when we need people to go do the jobs that the economy needs and wants and values, seems to me a very, very wrong way to go about solving the problem, if you believe there is a problem. The pro if you, what you need to do is have a level playing field so that people can make the choices they want to make and take the jobs that they want to take, not to decree a, an equality of result. That's just not been well, the way that the equal you opportunity have, you laws have You obviously have haven't read my bill. The Equal Pay Act provides that level playing field. It doesn't mandate exactly what you've got to pay. It just says, let's put it all out there. Let's get the information we need. Let's compare them. And let's provide a basis that if, uh, if it uh, requires uh, equal skill, responsibility, effort, and working conditions, uh, then the pay should be equalized. It just provides a, a, an avenue for women to, to bring an action if employers aren't living up to that. We didn't say you've got to do it. Well, now, Minnesota did it because that was the public sector. I'm just saying that in that case, you can see what happened when the government did do that. It closed the gap and did it in a way, I think, that benefits all of, all of the state. I don't, I, wouldn't, I don't know about that. But uh, I'm just saying that the Equal Pay Act basically says, look, we're, gonna, we're, going to, we're going to get the information out. We're going to compare these. We're going to make this information available so that women know what these other jobs are paying. And, and therefore, then, uh, then they have a case of action uh, uh, to take. It's, a, it's a similar to what we've done under so many other civil rights laws in our country. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act doesn't say you have to hire a person with a disability. We didn't say that. We just said if you're hiring people, you can't discriminate against someone because they have a disability. That's all we're saying. Absolutely. And that's what we're saying in the Equal, Equal Pay Act. Too. Well, Senator Harkin, if I could just respond to um, your comment for one minute. I, I agree with you completely that there is unfortunately pervasive and systemic sex discrimination as well as discrimination on the basis of race and national origin and disability that still persists in the workforce. Where I part company with Ms. Brown is that I think that the problem that these bills are intended to address is that the market forces themselves not only cannot alone solve these inequities, but in fact are based on the kinds of prior barriers and discrimination that have prevented people like women, like minorities, like people with disabilities from reaching the same level playing field that men have occupied. All these bills would do, they would not diminish innovation. They would not mandate particular levels of pay for particular jobs. What they would do is insist that employers take a look at the jobs that they have in their workforces and make sure that there aren't artificial barriers that are limiting the pay that people should get for working in them. So your point being, how can you expect a system to adjust itself to change when the very system, uh, to change the basis when the system itself is set up on that basis? <laughs> You're right. 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 Like a con That's right. You can't do that. Uh, interesting point. Uh, I didn't have any more. Did you have any it's more? It's getting metaphysical. Yeah, it's getting <laughs> metaphysical here. You're right. Um, uh, I really didn't have anything else that... Uh... Oh, I, one question I just want to get out for the record. Um, to all of you, I'll go down. Do you believe that, uh, that there are an over... Is there an incentive for bringing frivolous lawsuits under the current law? Are there incentives for bringing the frivolous lawsuits? I hear that all the time. Oh, people just bring frivolous lawsuits. Is, is there an incentive for that? Or can you speak to that or not? Well, I, uh, I, don't, I can't speak very much to that, but I can say one thing about that, um, which is it's hard for uh, uh, women whose damages are not great to be, to be able to bring lawsuits because they can't, get, uh, uh, they can't afford the upfront costs or get lawyers to take on their cases. So the way uh, the law is now certainly privileges those who have higher earnings and therefore higher damages when they're discriminated against. Um, unless you can get qualified as a class and do the Walmart thing, which is very difficult, it's, it's, yeah. it's very hard to, to, uh, to get over those hurdles, for sure. I might also add that it is not a pleasant experience to be engaged in a lawsuit. I don't know very many people who would choose that route. And in fact, part of the problem with the current law that the Paycheck Fairness Act and the Fair Pay Act would fix is that the likelihood of success 
even in meritorious cases under current law, is very low because mm -hmm. of the procedural hurdles, because the remedies, as Dr. Cohen mentioned, are not great enough to ensure that a woman will be fairly compensated for her time, and because the substantive standards of the law don't allow her to make her case in a way that really goes to the heart of the basis for these wage disparities. And, and to pile on, <laughs> in, in addition to the, uh, it just seems, it, women know this is very expensive to pursue any kind of litigation. So, and, and most women don't have that money to do this. So you have to think long and hard whether you want to sue and pursue even the slightest grievance for the cost, both financially, for what it does, you lose your job, uh, you, lose, you can lose your career, you lose your husband often, uh, and, your, and your mental health. Every woman I've talked to who has pursued litigation uh, has paid a h horrific personal price and usually hangs in only to try and change that employer's environment for the women who are working there or come, come after her because it is such a long, hard, and expensive process. Ms. Brown, can you ask? Yes. Um, if, if I may, I, several points. First of all, I think there are a certain number of frivolous, frivolous lawsuits, but I think that the courts are set up to screen those out. I, I think that the more energy is spent and would be spent under this bill with employers having to try to think about whether they could record contemporaneously every objective factor that goes into every pay decision, which is something they have to make about every employee periodically, than they make defending frivolous lawsuits. The, the problem with the bill is that it's putting the onus on the employer for all sorts of choices that people make that are a result of social and, and, and familial um, patterns of behavior. And I think to try to dictate something different is wrong. And to suggest that if those guidelines are out there, they'll be purely voluntary, I think is, is naive. And I don't think that's really the intention, because the expectation or the hope would be that courts will impose them on employers, and I think that that really would wreak havoc. The other thing I would say is, since the Supreme Court in the sexual harassment context and the punitive damages context urged employers to create effective internal complaint processes so that they could avoid liability or the imposition of punitive damages, there has been a very, very healthy development of effective internal complaint processes. So you only see the tip of the iceberg when you see things that get to court. But the effective resolution of many, many complaints doesn't reach the public record. And I think it's an encouraging development since those cases that has greatly um, helped work things out informally. I, I'd just add that I think that's a perfect example of the way in which the laws can spur necessary social change. Anything else? Yeah, thank you very much. Well, listen, this has been a very good, very enlightening hearing. I thank you all for being here and uh, your testimonies. And uh, thank again Senator Clinton for her great leadership in this issue and for calling this hearing together and making sure that we have it. I think, again, this is an issue that's not going to go away, and we've just got to keep at it until we, uh, until we overcome the obstacles and get a better system of fairness out for people uh, in our society on, on so many bases. Uh, sex discrimination, race, disability, all these areas, uh, just again to make our society more fair and more equitable. And I think then the free enterprise system works even better. So with that, the committee will stand adjourned.